those folks who watch and listen to this podcast often know that my favorite team is the Atlanta Falcons. Well, uh, that might have changed last week at the President's Cup, and I have the captain of the team on, Trevor. How's it, pal? How are you doing? Hey, thanks. The Falcons, hey? Yeah, yeah they, they, they had a win last uh, week. They had a win last week, no? Yeah, mm. that's good. The Cowboys, too, which is uh, also becoming quite rare. So that's good. They've got a couple of wins now. So that's my that's my team. But I'm doing great. Good to join you finally. Yeah, man. Uh, for To put into context, for those of you who don't know, this is my younger <laughs> brother, Trevor, captain of the International President's Cup team, master champion of 08, multiple winner around the world. Um, yeah, he is a Dallas Cowboys fan. I'm a Falcons fan. It's a long story. We won't go there. Um, Trev, uh, first off, how are you doing, man? Have you decompressed some after what was, a, I'm sure, a long week for you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, looks like I'm going to get a few more days off here with this hurricane uh, barreling down on uh, on Florida. Uh, but uh, yeah, took Monday off mm. for the recovery after our big party on Sunday <laughs> night. I saw, um, I saw some videos. Yeah, we actually we actually had some IVs come in for the players and caddies before they got on their planes to their respective countries. So we were prepared for that even. But uh, yeah, I got back home. Nice to be back and uh, just lay low a little bit. I actually played a little golf yesterday. Um, even though I watched incredible golf at the President's Cup, it didn't seem to inspire my own game. I was terrible yesterday. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got a few days off here now before I go and work at the Shriners next week. So we'll be laying low. Hopefully, everybody stays safe with this hurricane, and and um, we can we can rebuild the places that that are being affected by this. Amen to that. Okay, um, let, let let's start this. Everyone who listens knows you. I, I think you had a large fan base, which was just expanded exponentially after the way you led this team of yours over the last few years to be honest with you not just the one week so so what i want to do to kick us off before we dive into the nitty-gritty is just talk about the journey because everyone thinks of the week but man you were invested in this thing from when you were announced and this is like almost three years ago now so so just mm. a brief synopsis of the trip sure i uh you know i was heavily inspired by by what ernie else did down in australia you know, he really did take this team on his back and wanted to create something new mm -hmm. and fresh. And he was smart enough to realize that, you know, we were pretty much two decades into this competition at that point, And our team had not really involved, evolved at all. And uh, he thought that one of the ways that he could do that would be by us starting to take control of our team, really uh, getting invested, not just with the captains, but with the players as well. And he decided to do that by rebranding. Yeah. And so he has a number of friends that are in special forces. And he had been talking to them about the best ways to create team chemistry, camaraderie. Uh, and he wanted to come up with a logo for our team. So with their help, um, they designed the shield, mm -hmm. which is what it is today. And uh, there's distinct meaning that goes into that shield and what it stands for. Do you care to share? Because I was so impressed because there was a number of your guys last week when I heard them, you know, the whole mantra of the event is for country, for the cup. And then you hear the U.S. team going for the USA, for the cup. And your guys were all like for the shield. I mean, they were in behind this thing. What's some of the deeper meaning of it? Yeah, we got to protect the shield at all times. You know, it's a, it's a combination of a, a, a Celtic knot or Celtic knot, whichever way you want to say it. The shield, uh, which which uh, the knot is more around being intertwined, faith, family. Yeah. Um, the shield, which is protection. You know, we see that throughout military, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know, even at, at home in Africa as well. And uh, then, if you start to look deeper in and amongst that shield, you see uh, two flags. So the two flags, the two pin flags, or flags of our countries that come together there in the middle. So those three things are intertwined. Each player has a very clear understanding of it. Mm -hmm. We've educated them and explained it to them. Uh, they're all in, they love it. They absolutely love it. And they love the fact that we can finally, even though we all come from different corners of the globe, we can come together and represent this one logo yeah. for one week. And so it's been something that's extremely powerful. 
Um, you know, Ernie Els will be the godfather of our team because of it. Mm -hmm. He turned the page and started something new and fresh for us that we could get behind. And then Comnita and I wanted to uh, carry that ball forward. You know, if he's, if he's created this foundation for us, how can we take that to the next level and improve what we found for whoever comes after us? And then they can do the same. And uh, we had the extra year because of COVID. So I started thinking to myself, okay, how can we build this franchise? And it hit me that, you know, our team, our players, we represent billions of people all over the world. When you start to bring in India, you start to bring in China, yeah. um, Japan, all over Asia, down into Australia, New Zealand, and then across um, Africa, South America, and into Canada. I mean, that is a ton of people. Yeah. And I was trying to think to myself how I could inspire people to become fans. And then if they love the game and they want to support our team, how could they find some merchandise to actually support us? And it struck me that one of the things that I love about America, one of the beauties about America and the patriotism that this country has is you can pretty much go anywhere and buy something with an American flag on it. You go to the 7-Eleven and get a koozie or a cup or a flag or a T-shirt with an eagle or the stars and stripes or something. And I was like, man, you can't find a piece of merch with the shield on it anywhere in the world. And so I challenged the PGA Tour to really jump behind this and invest a lot of money and time and effort. Uh, they bought in and uh, they started doing that. And that was when we created our fan shop. That was when we created our social media so that we could uh, start to include everybody for sure. That was priority number one. But uh, number two was, how can we start to tell the story of the athletes that represent the Shield? Mm -hmm. You know, how can we let people learn more about Matsuyama, Scott, the Korean guys that are coming through, Siwoo Kim, Tom Kim, K.H. Lee? These guys all have their own story of overcoming adversity, mm -hmm. picking their lives and their families up, moving to the US to compete on the PGA tour, learning a totally That's new cool. culture, mm -hmm. putting their kids in schools in a totally different culture to what they're used to in their home countries. Uh, and so they all have a really cool heartwarming story to tell. And I wanted to create a platform to where we could start doing that over and above understanding just what cool guys these are. Like I'll, I'll zoom in on the Koreans for a second, you know, these guys are so popular in our team room. They are hilarious. Like <laughs> some of the best humor you would ever find. They're self-deprecating. Mm -hmm. They love chirping each other and everybody else in the team laughing. Really joyous people to be around. Mm -hmm. And not everybody thinks that. If I throw out the name Siwoo Kim or KH Lee, not everybody thinks that. So we wanted to be able to create these platforms so people could start to understand who we are, what we stand for, tell our story, and essentially build a franchise. You know, we, we love this event. We want it to be around. It's been around uh, 20, 25 years. We want it to be around for the longest period. So all these youngsters around the world who are inspired and love this game can can look to try and make this team and represent the shield. I'm glad you say that because, you know, you and me, we South Africans uh, and I essentially speak for everyone around the world. You know, you're growing up and you want to be on the PGA Tour. You're growing up and you watch the Ryder Cup and we never really had anything. But now this is becoming real. Uh, mm. I want to ask you this quickly. Um, is the merchandise still available? Can fans still go to the fan shop wherever? And if so, where is that? Yeah, it is. If you go on my social media ever, as of this moment, um, and then also our team social media on Instagram and Twitter, uh, there is a link in the bio there that sends you straight to the fan shop. There's probably 10 or 15 options for you to buy there right now. Really cool stuff. Um, Kamnit and I had a hand in, in designing some of it and being involved uh, right from the grassroots level. And, uh, you know, hopefully we continue to build that. I was extremely proud and impressed with the job uh, that the vendors did last week. The merchandise center was 
gigantic Huge and it was filled with some incredible stuff like this hat i'm wearing right now Folks, get on youtube so you can see this cool hat that he's got on right so, now if so it's, it's, go on it's got a bunch of shields it has the outline of the state of north carolina and and then the president's cup logo right here so they had amazing stuff in that merch shop they actually had all of our shirts that i custom designed um that our team was wearing throughout the week I saw and they did Everall, a great job. Every day, Ben Everall on the course had well, he wasn't matching your outfits, but he had the shirt, the black shirt with a with a with a shield on and stuff. And I was like, Benny, you all in? And he goes, I'm all in. Kept on yeah. saying to me, Do you believe in miracles? Hey, <laughs> before we get into like the lessons to learn, I, I need to ask this because I'm a big color guy, and you know me, I love to wear black on Sundays. It's kind of a nod to Mister Player and Johnny Cash in a way. Um, the colors, the black and the gold are so powerful together. And every time you guys came out, not to say that the red, white, and blue, which isn't powerful in its own right, but you guys sure. seem to sort of grab a, the fan's eye just because of the black, like the gold. It was real powerful colors. I mean, was this thought out for the colors of the team? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely was. And it's worked out really well. Something that I was extremely proud of over the week Mm -hmm. was it was the first time that we were wearing team colors down in Australia. Even though we had the shield, we wore some blue, we wore some green, we wore gray. And I wanted to change that because, I, you know, like I said, if we're trying to build this franchise, we need to allow people um, to understand and know what that entails. And um, so we had a few cool nods. Wednesday was, was something um special it was the first time we wore black and gold in yeah. this team's history uh, that was the day that we had our official photos so those uh, that day will be memorialized so to speak the first time we wore black and gold i spoke to the players and caddies in the bus on the way to the golf course that day and explained that to them they were all um really pumped about that uh, then we came out um on the Friday in the black shirt with a bunch of little gold shields on that again was, um, you know, just trying to show people how much we love the shield and what it stands for Saturday because of the 36 holes, I wanted to go in light colors. So we went with the all beige or all, all beige. Um, also a shout out to Scotty. It was, it was his 10th, <laughs> it was his 10th president's cup. So it was a little bit of a joke in the team room with him. Um, and he got a kick out of that. And then Sunday, yeah, all black. Mm. All black because I think it's powerful. I think it's kind of badass looking. And, uh, you know, same with Gary. He told he told me when, when I was young that he wore all black on Sundays because he would feel the sun giving him energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a story I told the guys on the way to the course on Sunday. Uh, but, yeah, we thought about a lot of little things, little nuances like buttons on – um, the collars, uh, the way the collars were designed differently. I kept the logos really small. Uh, something that I love about Augusta Nationals merch is how discreet and classy the logos are. Also for functionality. So when you're going into a dress position, you don't have this huge patch of embroidery getting in the way. Right, um, so all of those little things were thought about to try and make it functional, classy, respectful, um, and powerful. So, you know, we tried our best to think of everything. We were fortunate to have the extra year uh, to, to put those things in place. And, and I, I mean, I can't finish that story without just giving a massive thank you to the countless amounts of people that supported us, um, vendors, people at the tour, our backroom staff, mm. um, just giving of their time and effort. Uh, trying to bring our dream to life, so there was a lot of people involved to get us to that point. It was real. I, I'm, I'm, I will long remember this President's Cup for many reasons, you know, naturally, but, but, but just the way the whole the international squad, squad was portrayed, the way you guys looked, the way you guys banded behind the shield, it was, it truly was tremendous. Um, all right, I said to you I wanted to talk about overcoming obstacles because every golfer listening to this, they're happening thick and fast all the time. Um, and, and I, when this whole thing started, I spoke with you in Detroit a few seasons ago and you were talking about how you're going to rework some qualification systems and stuff. And you were already then meeting with players to start to, you know, get a feel for the unification of them. 
But then you get handed this live stuff and all of a sudden life becomes a whole lot more challenging. So personally, because I was so impressed at you, how you kept your focus despite the was going, what was going on around because everyone everywhere in the golf industry was talking about this yet you seem to remain resolute and it's something you've always done throughout your playing career and i don't know if this was natural or if you had to work on it so i'd love your your, your take on just overcoming that first challenge you had well you know i did it i did it for my players i did it for our players our shield our team i just felt like from the start what kind of leader would I be if I wasn't being strong and I wasn't being committed? Yeah. I've always felt like the best leaders lead by example rather than telling people what to do. I've always been very much against mandates and rules. I don't think you get the best out of people when you try and force them to do something. Mm -hmm. They perform much better. They perform to their full potential when you put them in a space to where they want to do it. Yeah. And so it was, it was more about me being committed and showing the guys that were being loyal and faithful that we're going to be okay. Yeah. We're going to be okay. We're going to have a team of people that want to be there, a team of people that are committed to our team, committed to our goal of being the first team to win on American soil. And we just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. And so that really was the thought process for me. Were there times when I was extremely frustrated and irritable and maybe even downright angry? Absolutely. It's part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, but once again, I don't think you should be suppressing that. I think you should be rolling with that, experiencing that, because in a lot of ways, that's when you learn your most is when, when you're down in the trenches and you're going through that gamut of emotions. So um, that was it for me. That was it for me. And it showed me a lot about a lot of different people, whether it be caddies and players and agents. I learned a lot. Yes. I learned a lot. Oh, yeah. And uh, But for, for our squad, our group, um, you know, those guys were committed. They were so committed and it meant so much to me. And I think where it really showed up was on Saturday. You know, we were in a deep hole, eight, two down on Friday night. And if you don't have that internal belief and toughness in your teammates and in your system and in your structure and in your, your, your leaders, um, that thing could have been over on Saturday evening. Mm -hmm. But when that adversity came, we were ready. We were ready for all of that. We were ready to fight. We'd been through so much before we had learned over the last couple of years, a lot about each other. And uh, that's why I was so proud of them on Saturday when, when they fought like crazy for us to win the day. Man, and, and for those folks that didn't see, it wasn't just a whole Saturday battle. You guys were down Saturday morning and it looked like more. And they battled back over the final few holes to get a split in the foursomes. And it was more of the same in the afternoon. It was a Herculean effort. Let's help folks who got to make that tough phone call. Because with the whole thing, you got, instead of four picks, you got six captain selections. Mm. You know, being a former college coach, that is a blessing and a curse because you can only put it wrong. Um, so you got to make a few guys happy with phone calls, but you got to make a few guys kind of not so happy with a phone call too. Help mm. help the folks listening to this who have that, phone, that tough phone call in front that you keep putting off and you keep putting off and you don't want to do it. Yet you had to pick up the phone and say, Hey, sorry, uh, whoever, um, you know, we're deciding to go ahead without you. Some insights about those tough phone calls. Yeah, it was extremely difficult, but you, you, you just got to do it. Mm -hmm. You can't shy away from it. It's like when my son comes home and he says, you, I've got so much homework. You won't even believe how much homework I've got. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get it done. And I always just say to him, you get it done by starting. Just start, just start anywhere. <laughs> and get going and eventually you're going to start creating some momentum and an hour in that heavy cloud is going to lift off of you and you, your pers perspective is going to change from there's no way I can get this done to I think I'm I think I'm getting this done I'm on my way now so you just got to go ahead and suck it up and get started but it was made easier for me because 
we had created the squad mentality over the last couple of years. And, you know, 25 to 30 players had bought into what we stand for. Mm -hmm. And they were all in regardless. And so I had to make three different calls. But the first ones were to the guys that hadn't made it. You made those first? So you got those? I made those. Right. Yeah, I made those first because I wanted to finish on a positive note. I was just because I knew that it was going to affect me and I knew it was going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just go ahead and get those out of the way. And immediately those players are rightfully disappointed because they have tried their best to make the team. And I knew how important it was to them. And you could hear the disappointment in their voices. But they know that I love them. And they know that the team loves them. And they know that they've been part of something special for the last couple of years anyway. So uh, my message to them was, look, I'm, I'm sorry that you're not going to make this team, but I want you to keep fighting to make the next team and the next team. And we're going to keep going and we're building something here. And you're a very important part of that. You've been part of the squad mentality for the last couple of years. And it was amazing to me that within the space of seconds, all of these guys that I called, I called five or six players. They all said to me, what can I do to help the team? Awesome. And that really showed me that uh, what we had done over the, over the previous time had worked because these guys were all in. Mm -hmm. And um, then the second phone calls I made, the second batch of phone calls were to the four players that were going to get the automatic picks. And so we had gone back and forth with our backroom staff, making sure that we had those dialed in in the correct order and players that we felt like could be additive to the team room, additive on the golf course, and that their games would match up with what we felt like we were going to face from the golf course and the American team. Those calls were great. Uh, on a couple of those occasions, we videoed they, those, we posted them on social media just so that everybody could get a feel for how those calls go down, how much it means to the players, how happy they are when they get that news. Yeah. So those were the easy ones. That was great. That was basically, congrats, you've made it. We love you. We believe in you. We know you've got what it takes. And we'll see you in a couple of days in Charlotte when we go for our team trip. Uh, and then I made two calls that I didn't anticipate at the start of this process. And I made two calls to, to Siwoo Kim and Cameron Davis. Mm -hmm. and I told them there's good news and bad news. You, you're not on the team right now, but there is a strong possibility that you are going to make this team. And I want to know if, if that's okay with you, are you good to hang with us? Are you good to come and be a part of our trip? Are you good to still be involved in all the day-to-day -day stuff between now and the event? If somebody gets sick, somebody gets COVID, somebody gets injured, or one of the automatic qualifiers decide to leave. Yeah. And man, were they all in. No. Man, were they all in. And that was cool. And they came on our team trip. They got to know the golf course. They got to know everybody else was in the team. And the way it worked out, by the time we left lineup. our team trip, they yeah. knew that they were in. They were in. And so that was a special moment in and of itself. We were at a team dinner on the Monday night. So this is the Monday after the Tour Championship. And um, we were at a good friend of mine's house who lives on the golf course. And, uh, and I had found out that those guys were going to be in. Right. And we made a big deal of it. Mm -hmm. And they got a standing ovation from the other, from the other players. Mm -hmm. And those guys immediately it was an emotional moment and they knew that uh they're in and they were so pumped about it and uh that was a big moment for our team coming together so th those were the three different types of calls and uh you know really also it's about understanding who you're dealing with understand your 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 personnel understand your your friendships the people you're calling Try and put them in their sweet spots, you know, know their personalities, know how they react to different things and then treat them accordingly so that they can be comfortable. That was something that I learned from, from Debo Swinney, something that I took to heart. Yeah. And, and the cool story to put a bow on that all folks is, uh, yes, Siwoo is in, but he's not necessarily in just yet. And then he's in, and then all of a sudden he has the honor 
and you put him out there first off in signals and he comes through with a point. So I guess the story behind the story, yeah, too, for everyone who might be struggling or is just on the cusp of a team or whatever, you never know what the future is likely to hold. Yeah, sure. Look, I had an inkling mm -hmm. that those guys were going to make it. They didn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they didn't. Yeah. Because I didn't want to oversell it to them because then if uh, if something did change, then it really would have been an anticlimax for them. So I had an inkling. We had a lot of belief in them. I have I have um, got a ton of respect for Siwoo's game and you know where his ceiling is. I think he has the ability to be top ten in the world. Mm -hmm. he just needs to be motivated every time he tees it up. The way he was motivated at the Presidents Cup, yeah. he need, he's one of those players that needs to be interested and engaged. And when he is, the sky's the limit for his talent. Uh, so, yeah, as far as going as the first tee shot or playing on Sunday in the first match against Justin Thomas, we had actually planned for him to hit the first tee shot on Thursday in the alternate shot. Okay. And he was getting prepared for that. He knew that uh, actually on the Sunday before the tournament, he knew that that was going to be a good chance of that happening because I wanted him to start preparing for that moment. Mm -hmm. I had him hit a bunch of tee shots off of that first tee. We were making some noise and getting in his head. Um, <laughs> Nothing like Just, you know what I want to stop you there because that folks is preparation. You know, preparation <laughs> isn't banging a bunch of seven irons on the range. It's like you're trying to put yourself in the environment and and sort of feel what you are might go through. You can can never really uh, reciprocate or, or or replicate that, I should say. But you can try, and I think that's an awesome lesson to learn. Yeah. So we had to be ready for different scenarios. Um, one of the beauties for me where the President's Cup is better than the Ryder Cup is the two captains get to use strategy when you send the picks out mm -hmm. because Davis will put one down, then I'll put one down, and then I go, and then he goes and goes back and forth. Whereas at the Ryder Cup, you just write your teams on a piece of paper and both captains hand it in at the same time, and it's like a blind draw. Nobody knows who's going where. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit more strategy and nuance to the way we can do it in the President's Cup, which is so much fun for the captains. It is a blast. We love it. And so uh, as defending champion, Davis was supposed to get to pick first. Mm -hmm. And if he picked first, Si Wu would have been hitting our first tee shot okay. or for the first tee with Cam Davis as his partner. But because he decided to defer, then a different strategy kicked into place for us. And um, Scott and Matsuyama were going first. Adam smashed one of the first tee. I remember being there. It was quite a moment. Um People can get already <laughs> listening to you and watching you and seeing your passion for it. But, but Tom Kim, who was like a lightning rod, right? and the guy became he he was always good. He became a star overnight, basically. Um, said after the event that you should go into motivational speaking. Now, <laughs> <laughs> not not everyone has a Trevor Immelman on their wing or whatever, telling them how good they are and they can do this and all the rest of it. A lot of golfers watching this are like, I'm gonna go and play my member guest on the weekend or my club championship or something. But golf is that thing that can grind you down to your last nerve. Speak about, you know, being motivational, having a motivational mindset, having that mindset you've now inferred to Ward, where it's like, just keep on getting up, keep on doing the thing, keep on doing the right thing. Your time will come. I would love your thoughts there. Yeah, just one foot in front of the other mentality. Yeah, you know, that's extremely important. Belief is extremely important. I, I, I was talking to the players about that uh, from our team trip. Was I said to them, you know, in these practice rounds, we're out there, we're goofing off, we're having some fun, we've got, a, you know, a few side bets going. We were playing for little trophies on that trip. Uh, sorry? Were you playing? Hell no. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> Go on. Nobody now. wants to see that. Uh, and I, I said to them, you know, while, while you're going around in these practice rounds, take a moment and, and imagine what it's going to be like. You know, imagine 50, 60,000 people piled in here. Imagine everybody rooting against you. Imagine the, the noise when you make a putt. Imagine making a putt to win a point. How it would feel if we win, if we lift the trophy. Like, start to let yourself go there. And in those moments, like, believe, like, like plant that seed way down there that mm -hmm. this is possible. Look, we are huge underdogs. Nobody really was giving us a chance to win, but you still got to go play. I've seen crazier stuff happen in the world of sport. 
like the craziest, mm -hmm. you know, and I hate to bring this up, but remember the Falcons in the Super Bowl? <laughs> you know what? Okay. I actually just, let me, let me get my guy on the line because I called Vegas and I knew it was highly likely you were going to bring the Falcons <laughs> misstep so, in the Super Bowl. But you know, the ahead. Falcons are like 25 points ahead already at halftime or something like that, 27-3 or whatever it was. And who would have thought 28-3? <laughs> who would have thought they were going to lose? Like I've seen some crazy stuff. Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson in his prime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the miracle on ice when the Americans beat the Soviets shucks there, there's so many examples the New York Giants beat the undefeated Patriots in the Super Bowl when a guy catches a ball holding yeah. the ball against his head mm -hmm. crazy stuff happens in sport so start to believe because we're going to fight we're going to go out there and fight and see what happens so um, you know that's really the thing for me is just keep going the sport is so 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 difficult and it does grind you down. It it did that to me. In mm -hmm. a lot of ways, I'm speaking from my own personal experience. Yeah. The sport beat me to a pulp. And the last few years of my career, I was like struggling. I knew that I wasn't quite good enough to compete anymore. And, um, you know, those are difficult moments. But you just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And the other interesting thing that I learned, unfortunately, a little too late in my career is you can hit world-class shots when you don't have confidence. Cow preach. Hold on. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Trevor. This is the fifth gospel. Go. All right. You're yeah. on. Mm -hmm. You really can. You really can. It, it's, it dawned on me in about 2018 that there were times when I felt very confident over the shot and in my swing and with my strategy and I would still hit a bad shot at times and then vice versa a lot of times I was standing over it thinking I was going to hit it in the water or hit it out of bounds or didn't like the way the tee shot was setting up and I would stripe one down the middle or hit it to two feet and I just thought to myself well why does this happen mm -hmm. uh, and I just started to realize that in a lot of cases the harder I tried to put myself in what everybody talks of as the ideal mental state, the more I was shackling myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I let all of that go, I felt like I could play a lot freer. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that, that I was speaking to those players about. I'm so glad you said that because your your marching orders essentially, and, and and you dropped it in one of the first press conferences I watched, which I must tell you, I sat here on my couch at home before I came to Charlotte, and I had tears streaming down my face watching you in this role because I've known you, younger brother, obviously player, major champion, now broadcaster, now team captain, and I could see the evolve the, how you've evolved through it all, and your marching orders were like play free and then in your opening ceremonies you ended your your and uh, your your anecdotes and your observations and stuff with let's go team play free so so I, I sort of see you now finishing the journey with this realization you've come to about playing this game yep exactly exactly I, because because we had so much time to think about how we wanted the week to play out we really did drop a lot of nuggets along the way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, seeds. I spoke about seeds earlier and planted a lot of seeds throughout all of our team gatherings over the two years. And uh, the players noticed a lot of it again during the week. When they walked into our team rooms, they started reading the quotes on the walls, looking at the photos on the walls, um, you know, like a lot, I spoke about how big the mountain is to climb. Yeah. Uh, the huge mountain that was in front of us. And it was, you know, that American team is so damn good. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we know because we're out on tour week in and week out covering these guys and studying them and their stats and how they play and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And they're just not many weaknesses when you come to those American players. Mm -hmm. And they've got Hall of Famers leading them uh, as captains. And so it was just, it, this talk of a huge mountain to climb. And, and one of the big pictures we had in our team room at the hotel um, was, was of Everest. And the quote was something along the lines of, 
you remove a mountain by by moving one stone at a time mm -hmm. and it kind of goes back to the, what i say uh to my son when he complains about all the homework he's got you just got to get in there and just start and just start and keep going and if you get knocked down you get up and you keep going and eventually eventually hopefully um before the clock runs out on a match or you know in, in whatever you're going through in business or whatever eventually you're going to start to notice the difference and you're going to see the big chunk you've taken out of it and for us we noticed that on on saturday evening when all of a sudden you know we're eight two down on friday all of a sudden we win the day on saturday and now we're still a long way back but mathematically we still have a chance to win the tournament on sunday so um you know it, it was awesome to see these guys respond i'm thankful that they were were open to a lot of the stuff we were talking about uh to them behind the scenes the caddies were amazing our wives and partners were amazing our backroom staff was just so good um and to see those players respond and then step up when the moment came sure was a lot of fun but still um tough that we came short but we learned a lot that we'll be able to put into play next time yeah and you speak of those seeds and the beauty of some of those seeds is i think a lot of them are still yet to germinate and you're likely to see them out of these guys now as they venture on forward into their pga to a career and, and president's cups in the future um I, I sort of have to ask this because you know there's sunlight everywhere and sunlight is awesome but sunlight creates some shadows and and I want to know from you, let's help a, the golfer who's sort of struggling. And sometimes it sort of sucks when it's what you've worked towards and it's all there and it just doesn't happen for you in the week. And, and there were a couple of guys on your team that battled a little for form and started to struggle on the greens by what I was seeing. I, I don't mm -hmm. know the whole story. And yet their captain, Trevor, stuck with him, which is, is, a, is, is admirable in its own right. What do you let? Let's help the golfers struggling. What did you say to a Corey who was, you know, to me one of the best guys on the team, but really battled during the week? Was there anything you would say to them before they went out? Just that I love them and that I trust them. Right. You know, it's interesting looking back. It, armchair quarterbacking is quite a thing, and it, it happens. It happens a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, it's amusing to read. A lot of times, it's complete bs a lot of times there's some truth to it so you have to be careful with where you pick and choose uh and what you take to heart but i did not want to make knee-jerk reactions to a particular match yeah we had gathered tons and tons and tons and tons of data of not just our team but every player there and of the golf course and we had a strategy and I know that over the course of a week, players are going to eventually play to their level. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Adam, I mean, I, I was so I, I actually complimented you on the on the broadcast feed where a lot of folks, Adam and Nadeki, took a really hard loss in the opening match, big loss, like a statement sort of a deal. But you stuck with them, and then they came through on for you on Saturday morning when they sort of started the ball rolling in the opposite direction, and that was testament to you just backing them. Yeah, but how can I, how can I, as the captain of the team, be preaching to these guys for months on end that they need to trust the process and they need to trust our team and trust the players and believe in what we were doing, and then as soon as adversity comes. I blow the whole thing up and start again. How would you feel as a player if that happened? You'd be going, wait, what the heck? No. I have one bad round of golf. I miss a few putts. The other team is chipping in and making everything from all over the place. And I lose. And now I'm getting kicked to the curb. What happened to trust in the process? Yeah. What happened into believing in our team and believing in our strategy? So, it would have been for me the biggest possible blunder that I could have made would have been to send that message to the other 16 guys. And I'm talking about the 12 players and the four assistant captains. Mm -hmm. So I was not going to make knee jerk reactions. I felt like I'd learned my lesson observing a few Ryder Cups teams and President's Cup teams over the years to where they did that and it did not pan out well. So I was not going to do that. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, 
it's Sunday morning. You have a chance. Uh, we were all dressed in our black. All, all, all the international folks thought it was possible. I texted you um, Sunday evening and uh, Saturday evening, and we actually talked about it on our show after the big <laughs> win there on the final hole. And all of a sudden, Medina was 10-6, and they went into the break there with the Europeans celebrating, who were down, that they were essentially going to win the thing. And they did the following day. And I texted you, remember Medina, and I said this to my announced colleague as well. So then Sunday morning rolls around. You got Siwoo out first. It looked to me like you could just wind up and let him wind him up and let him go. But then you got Cam Davis and I had his match lining up up against a tour de force in Jordan Spieth, a guy that's going to wear you to your soul, boy, because of the way he plays the game. So sometimes I, this is to help golfers who've got this big match in front of them, or businessmen watching this who've got this big deal in front of them. What did you say to Cam? Did, did you say, I believe in you, I love you, go get it? Or was there something special? Or do you uh, don't care? <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if I should tell you. Uh, okay. Um, I can respect that. You know, some things have to stay in the team. I absolutely pulled both of those guys and spoke to them about it. They knew how big of a job they had. Mm-hmm. You know, I touched on it earlier. We have utmost respect for Siwoo's potential and for his ceiling and for his mental toughness um, when he is engaged. I knew that the crowd, um, Justin Thomas's antics when he, when he represents the U.S. team, I knew that none of that would affect Siwoo. None of it. Man, I, I actually, he, was, he was shushing crowds and stuff there on the 15th. <laughs> yeah, I actually knew that it would motivate him even more. Mm -hmm. uh and so yeah that was the evidence you know when it comes down to the wire there <laughs> on 15 green and he makes that eight footer and he starts shushing the crowd and they start oh, booing him yeah. and cheering him and he keeps going uh and and i was walking with him at that point and we were walking up to the 16th tee and i just said to him now you gotta hit now you gotta hit the fairway here on on 16 and make a birdie you know you gotta keep keep the pressure on him and he he didn't hit the fairway, but man, did he make a great birdie. Wedge shot was unreal. Yeah. It sure was. And he did that the night before, too, in a, at a very timely moment when him and Tom uh, were beating Cantley and Shoffley. So um, I wasn't worried about him being affected by the moment. Cam had played some brilliant golf, inspired golf through the week. Uh, he made that incredible putt on Sunday evening. He got the win with Siwu on Thursday to get our only point. And you know, the reason he got picked is we knew that his game was a brilliant matchup for Quail Hollow. And the guy hits it a mile, yeah, he putts high. well, he hits it high, he's got all the shots. And it's just a matter of him being exposed to that more and more, more and more. And you're going to see his name start to crop up in the bigger events more often. Um, and, uh, and so we trusted him in that moment to go out there. Also, we know Jordan Spieth is a future Hall of Famer, he's won three majors, player of the years, um, all those kinds of things. But Jordan up until that day also had not won a singles match mm -hmm. um, for the U.S. team. So, you know, we were trying to get a little edge there and see if we could keep something like that going. Didn't work out. He played, you know, Cam got off to a good start, was two up after two. And, and well, Spieth just went nuts through the middle part of the round and really played beautiful golf. Well, I don't know if you saw it, but I had the match. So he's two up through two, um, sort of in control. Three is that difficult four. Um, he hits a tee shot like it fell out of heaven down the middle of the fairway. And he fizzes a wedge in there behind the flag like 15 feet. Jordan misses from the same range. And they come to me I'm on the course. And I'm like, well, if you had to tell Captain Trevor, his guy's about to be three up through three on Jordan on the singles, <coughs> on top of Charlotte, let alone the world, you know. And so he hits this putt that just rims out. Then the next hole, it's a poor tee shot, impossible putt, puts it off the green and Jordan buries. But but whatever you said, he was, I mean, he had it going on for the first little bit. And then Jordan just sort of stayed in the game, I guess, is what he did. Yeah, he pushed Spieth to another level mm -hmm. uh, in on that back nine. And Jordan did step up. I'm wanting to say he made four birdies in a row around uh, the mid part of the round there to take control and showed his class, which was extremely impressive. I spoke to him about it on Sunday night. Uh, he was happy to finally get that monkey off of his back and get the singles win. 
and the week really that they had when you when you start to look at how their big dogs stepped up to the plate okay. max homer was undefeated thomas um only lost the one singles was undefeated um spieth was undefeated you know they needed some incredible performances from their big dogs to uh, to hold us at bay and uh, so that's something we're proud of you know we pushed them and with all due respect to the European Ryder Cup team at Whistling Straits, we pushed them a lot harder than what that team did. Yeah. So uh, whilst we didn't get the win, we take solace in some of that. We know we're on the right track and we just got to keep building this thing and, um, you know, see what we can come up with in Canada in a couple of years. Yeah, anything's possible if your attitude, your focus, your intention, all that sort of stuff you talk about is right. Last question. I'm sure there were there are millions of memories. Um is there one that really stands out to you from last week? There's, there's, there's a, there's a few. Uh, the first one is Monday night, our first dinner in, in our team room. Um, you know, Carmenita and I invested a lot of time and energy into building these team rooms, building them just right, having them be a great place for everybody to hang out, players and caddies and wives and, and, um, and just seeing the look in their eyes when they walked into that room for the first time mm -hmm. and how much they appreciated our effort. Uh, and it was like it hit them, you know, the moment, the moment hit them. And, um, you know, I had, a, I had a long story to tell them that night that was centered in and around um, the Wright brothers and first flight in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And how they had failed thousands of times before they eventually succeeded. And it was a pretty impactful moment. And I gave them a gift that showed them that they were a part of something special. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was something that I'll remember for a long time. Thursday morning, opening tee shots, uh, that the, the opening ceremony with, uh, you know, that, Coliseum environment with the the American anthem being sung. Darius, the fly Rucker, over. Didn't, Darius Rucker did a fantastic job. Uh, he did an amazing job, and he's been such a great ambassador for golf. We're so thankful for everything that he's done for our sport, and how much he loves it. And uh, you know, Davis and I getting a chance to 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 share a little time together there and enjoy the moment. That was special. Adam Scott kicking us off in his tenth Presidents Cup, becoming the most capped international player in history. That was special. Uh, the other thing that really hit me was, was Friday, uh, excuse me, Saturday afternoon when we're coming down 18, uh, with those two matches down to the wire and, uh, you feel that energy, you feel the passion, you feel the fight, you feel the respect amongst the competitors. And this, this hole, this 500 yard hole is just lying 10 deep with, with fans. That was something that, you know, the coolest moment I've ever experienced on a golf course was when Tiger Woods won the 2019 Masters. That was something that um, transcended our sport, in my opinion. And being there on the grounds that day was something special. But this was right there with it. The, the, the feel and atmosphere around that 18th hole when Tom Kim flushes the two iron from 240 to 10 feet. Oh, that, makes shot, that, shot, that shot to me still, I mean, goodness gracious, he's coming in with two iron. The rest of them, they've got nine irons and eight irons and wedges left in there. It's so funny because I joined up with that that uh, match on 17 fairway and was kind of starting to get in their ear and tell them how, how much we needed it and that they, they needed to fight. I knew that I could treat him and see we like that because they respond well to toughness. Yeah. They respond well to like, I need you right now. And um, so I knew they were the right guys to do that with. And I was right there with them the whole time. So he, they, they tie 17, we go to 18, he hits his tee shot. He walks over to me. He's like, man, I whiffed that. I'm going to be so far back. <laughs> so we start, see who hits it way right. And now I'm thinking, oh boy, both the American guys flush it down there. They, they um, hit beautiful tee shot. And we're walking up the fairway and we get there. And I'm with him and his caddy, Joe. And I hear the number 237 to the hole. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> and and so I'm standing next to the bag. And Siwoo's way right. And we're, we're going back and forth. Camillo is down with Siwoo. 
And he was great on the course. I got to tell you, I uh, Camilla's Camilla's the best. He's the best. We love him. He did exactly what we thought he would do for our team. And we were trying to figure out, you know, because in better ball, whoever's away, you could you make your partner go if you want. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to figure out who's best to go next. See, we was like, I've got a shot. I can get it up near the green, and probably support him with a four. Maybe I chip in and get lucky. Who knows? Yeah. And I'm looking at Tom, and we're on the radio, and I'm like. He's got a shot. He can get it up near the green. What do you want to do? And Tom says, I'm going. And I was like, okay. So I said to Camilla, tell Siwoo to stand down. Tom's going. <laughs> and uh, so he grabs this two iron out the bag. And he gets over it. He makes his practice swings. He gets over it. And as he gets over it, I turn and I look behind me. And I see three American carts, like 12, 15 yards away from, from him. Like just off of the line. They're right there. I mean, they're making their presence. The parked, yeah, exactly. Oh, there's no doubt about it. They learned all this stuff from Tiger. You got you got Thomas and Spieth and Finau and Homer and the caddies and the wives, and they are there with the captains. You know, they're making this kid realize exactly how big this moment is. And he, as soon as it left the club face, it was just all over it. The ball was never going to be outside of 15 feet. And... um it was a moment that was very, very special. And I just remember grabbing him and saying to him, dude, that shot was incredible. That that shot was incredible. And then I said to him, but but don't think about it anymore. Stay focused. You've got to make that putt. Yeah. Because I thought I thought that I really did think the Americans would make a birdie because they hit such great tee shots and they're such great players and they they've shown us how well they step up when it really matters. So I felt like he had to make the the um, that putt for them to win, uh, for them to tie. And uh, gosh, when he made that putt, that was a cool moment. The whole week, it the whole week, we... the cup to me, I you know it was it it will be of the signature highlight from the event. Even though the Americans won, to me, I think that'll be the signature moment. That'll be the one that's shown in 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 teasers to come for the Presidents Cup. Yeah, it was a great moment for us. The whole week we were <laughs> we were saying to him, and Adam Scott started this actually. Um, and the whole week we were saying to Tom, "Are you ready to make the putt to win the cup? No, really. Are you ready to make the putt to win the cup?" And we had been telling him that since Monday. We'd been asking him that question, and be like, "I'm," and he kept saying, "I'm ready. I can't wait. I'm ready. I'm ready." And then, <laughs> and then, now he didn't get the chance to make the putt to win the cup, but he had a putt in a big time moment for our team uh, with the point on the line. And he rolled that thing in and I kind of laughed in the media afterwards when he went in there and he said, I wanted to make that putt more than anything in the world. And that, you know, that was a cool moment yeah. because um, you know, that's what like the veterans was, were, were, were planting those seeds saying that stuff during the week and uh, it lodged its, way somewhere in his brain and then after he makes it for him to say that that was that was pretty cool he he is a global superstar in the making he has absolutely everything mentally physically emotionally the way he communicates the energy he brings uh the heart that he has uh man he is an impressive young man well i will say this um thanks to you my family got to go experience it they got to watch tee shots on the first from right next to the first it was a lifetime experience and my eldest isabel you know she's seen tiger up close with me at the tour championship and you know he's he, he'll move you um she tom kim quickly became her favorite and she was on the course with me sunday and we called the early match davis and spieth and then we got a break and then they had me finish homer and kim and izzy was beside herself she was so sad when he started going down because when we joined he was three up mm. all of a sudden max sort of mounted this comeback so isabel was quite destroyed i have to ask this one more question thanks for your time you've played the game at a very high level you're a major champion you've won all over the globe you've defended your title even at the south african open which is hard to do now you're outside the ropes. You've been outside the ropes for a while and you've seen the game from that vantage point, which is wildly different to being inside the ropes with your hands on the rubber end of the golf club. The parting shot for the folks watching this to say, hey, you know, when you're over the ball, it's different to what we're seeing from the outside. Do you have something you could share? Because 
uh, everyone who's been an assistant coach to me, former players are like, holy cow, did I do that? Did I make that mistake? Should, should I have done that? And I'm like, mm, yeah, now you get to see. Yeah, it's much easier being a coach or a parent. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. It's much easier. Or a captain. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the stuff I had to worry about, I had to worry about, um, you know, making sure we put them in the right position from a standpoint of, you know, is their gear correct? Mm -hmm. Are the bus schedules correct? Is the food of the quality? Do we have the right food culturally for these guys to be comfortable uh, am I going to use the right words in the media? What am I going to say in the interviews? Uh, uh, you know, how are we going to run our strategy trying to match Davis's pairings? Those are the things I had to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, you can use your brain for those things. Yeah. And you can prepare in a lot of ways for those things. When you're out there actually competing with the ball in your hand, it, the, you know, that poem, that or that, you know, it's Roosevelt, I believe, the man in the arena. Yes. Like that is that is legit. Those are some of the truest words ever written down on paper or ever spoken. Yeah. The man in the arena or the woman in the arena deserves so much credit and kudos for exposing themselves and putting themselves on the line. It is so, so difficult. It's so difficult. And... um you know, I think the players could feel that that respect that we were giving them from that from that standpoint, because all of the assistant captains had played in President's Cups and and majors and competed at the biggest events, whether it be the players or world golf events, major championships. Uh, so, so you know, we were giving that respect to them because we know how difficult it is. That, that it's it's by far the toughest thing. Um, because you're having to not only have you sacrificed a ton of time to sharpen your skills to that level. But, you know, now you've got to be able to bring that in these moments. You've got to be able to show the heart, show the courage, the determination, the fight, the will to win. You've got to be able to deal with the anxiety and the nerves and the, the pressure. Uh, it's something special. And when you see players perform and pull shots off like i think of uh, the way the americans played the 15th hole during yeah. the week was spectacular it gave us a giant headache the time you know when i saw xander shoffley make that putt from in front of the green on that 15th water. hole with all of those crowds when when um you know we thought we were in good position on that hole when i saw uh tom hit the two iron or cam hit the three wood into 16 but making an eagle there um, on that Saturday afternoon, when when players pull off shots like that, there was a moment on Sunday in the singles. Sebastian Munoz on eleven, the drivable par four, the dog leg left with the water on the left. Mm -hmm. He drove it in the right bunker and hold the bunker shot for eagle. Yeah. And I was sitting on the the par three green across the water, uh, number fourteen, and I was like I giving still it. Want a to call it seventeen, <laughs> Yeah, I was giving it a fist pump. I was like, there goes Munoz. He's going to be two up now. And then Scotty Scheffler holds like a 50-footer right behind him to tie the hole in Eagles. When athletes pull that kind of stuff off, man, it is so impressive to me. It is so impressive to me because the emotional roller coaster that they're riding inside um, and managing is, 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 is quite something. So the fact that they step up and pull things off in the biggest moment is uh, I take my hat off to them and I have a ton of respect for that. Yeah. All right. You can take a bow in a second. First, please, um, please share with the folks one, one more time where they can go to get the merchandise, where they can go to follow you, follow the team, et cetera, et cetera. Let's continue. This is, we've got a global audience here too. Let's continue to, to build what you've uh, continued to build. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. I have pages on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, try and interact as much as I can. I think it's very important. Um, I've had a lot of rubbish hurled at me over the last six months or so, but hey, I guess Twitter's it's not a real of place. What, what do you hear that there was that one football player goes, no, Twitter's not a real place, man. <laughs> Sometimes I think that, but also there is uh, a lot of people with great opinions and great intentions who are wanting to reach out 
And so I don't want to jump off because I want to be there for those people too, creating a conversation and, um, and creating relationships, so to speak. So I deal with a lot of the rubbish and, um, and take solace in the, in the fact that there's a lot of good too. Uh, so people can find me in all of those spaces. Our team has Instagram and Twitter pages. Um, I really have to tip my cap to our social media team last week. They crushed it. Mm -hmm. They absolutely crushed it. I managed to uh, go through all of it last night and watch all of the videos and the, the stuff that they put together, particularly on our Instagram. If you go and go into the Reels section there and just watch the videos that they put together during the week. So much fun, so inspirational and motivational. Uh, so i got to give out a shout out to... to um, Vinny and Ali and the whole Ali, team. Ali said Kea with the pictures he was taking. Kea, they, they did such a great job. I, I challenged them. I expected a lot from them. And they stepped up to the plate and just knocked it out of the park. So you can follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. You'll see those merch accounts uh, there as well uh, to our, our uh, merch shop. There's probably 10 or 15 things available right now. Um, and I will be pressurizing our vendors and fanatics and the tour more and more to make sure that the shield and shield merchandise becomes widely available all over the world. Cause we, we need to continue building this franchise so that youngsters all over can dream about playing in the president's cup. Folks. I bought a hat that says I N T in gold in the front with a shield on the side. It's well worth your while. Go search it. Trevor, man, I've long had the most respect for you. I still do. You put in a fantastic job. Take a bow, man, and enjoy some rest. You'll be safe uh, during the hurricane. Uh, it's about to rumble through. Yeah, thanks, bro. I appreciate the time. And, yeah, thoughts with everybody that's uh, already been affected by this hurricane and about to be affected. We're hunkering down here in Orlando. Uh, hopefully everybody gets through this and uh, we can rebuild and keep moving forward.